Hey viewers, Oscar from MST TV here, and today I'm doing a Necros in-depth profile where I'll be teaching you basically how to play the deck and giving you a profile of what the basic core of the deck is. So if you didn't know already, Necros is a ritual-based monster deck that is very combo-oriented. It's a very versatile deck and its win condition is primarily based on gaining card advantage and being able to control the board with the monsters. The monsters itself are very very flexible and their effects range from removing monsters, bouncing monsters, banishing monsters, searching and recycling. It's insane and they cover probably the best effects in the game and all the effects you would ever want. The deck has amazing recurgency in searching because the mirrors can banish themselves in the grave and has a very high skill cap. So if you're a beginner player, I would not suggest playing this deck. There's lots of plays and lots of routes and lots of dead ends that can make you brick and lose the game. So the playstyle of Necros is really similar to Mermail and Prophecy because you search a lot to toolbox into what you need and you make a huge push using monsters to potentially end the game. The two most important parts of Necklos is one, continuing the circle and making sure you don't lead yourself or search yourself into a dead end and making sure that you can play all three mirrors in one turn to create the ideal push, which is the second part, where it's putting monsters on board to efficiently remove threats and create advantage while potentially threatening lethal to your opponent. So one important thing to note is the Necklos is actually a very resource-based deck. Having cards like Brio, or Clasals in your deck is very important and you want to keep them in there until you need to search them at the very last moment to search and connect to other pieces that you need. Unlike a lot of the other decks you see, uh, you want to keep a lot of cards in the deck and the more cards you have in the deck the better it is and a lot of amateur neckcloth players will try to cycle through their cards as fast as they can and that's actually not the right thing to do. So in terms of the deck core, what you need to play is 3 Manjus, 3 Senjus, 2-3 to three Shrits, and these are the most important cards of the deck. These start your combos and are very important combo pieces. You can also play 1 Trishula, 0-1 to one Decisive Armor, and 1 Gungnir. These are your win conditions and you need them to win, but you don't really need to open them because you can search them. So ideally, you search them. Uh, most players will play one Trishula and either a Decisive Armor or a Gungnir. It's important to note that Gungnir is very useful because it protects the Dijin lock. You can play two to three Valkyries, which are very important combo pieces for the Emerald play that I'll be showing you later, and it's a very good utility card. And you have to play two Brios, and you have to play three Unicors. You play one to two Clasolas, and it's just a connecting card. So Brio. Unicorn and Kosalos are all just connecting cards. Finally, for monsters, you play Dijin for the Dijin lock. And for spells, you have to play at least two mirrors, two kaleidoscopes, and two cycles. Some people play three kaleidoscopes or three cycles, it really depends to you. But the most important thing is you match the cycles with the Shrit numbers. And finally, you have to play Preparation of Rights. This card is just too good not to play, and it's a very nutty card. So in terms of variants of the build, uh, there's usually two major variants. The first one is the more streamlined version, which lets you play more tech cards. So the streamlined version will usually play three upstarts and two rotas. Rotas is a good card because it'll let you search for Klasalas and Shrit, which are more combo pieces, and upstart lets you draw into more combo pieces. The thing with upstart is that it actually leaves you with more room for tech. You can play two and play one more extra tech card, and you can also side it out. Siding is very difficult in Neckloth, and you the extra side space that Upstart gives is very, very helpful. So the second variant that a lot of Neckloth players are playing is the Armageddon Knight build. So this build plays two Rotas, two Armageddon Knights, a Shuttle Dragon, and Farfa. The advantage of this build is that Rota becomes a very versatile card that not only searches combo pieces, but also searches Armageddon Knight, which can be used as an MST or a Dijin Lockout. Shadow Dragon can pop any monster when sent from Armageddon Knight, and Farfa can target the Clasalus that is usually Dijin uh, to banish it and remove the Dijin Lock. What's important to note is that Trishla can actually negate Farfa from banishing because Farfa targets. So some tech cards you can play in Neckloth include Maxi, Effect Veiler, 
shared ride in the main board and in the side board. Mystical Space Typhoon, which is not very popular at the moment, but I think we'll see more play. Book of Moon, Book of Eclipse, which is very strong out to the gym lock, and it'll also flip your Majus and Senjus face down, which lets you flip some of them to get another search. Regeki, Dark Hole, which is also another good Dijin out and also really good against anti-meta. Vanity's Emptiness, Royal Decree, and the new hype card, Psalm Scolding. Psalm Scolding is great because a lot of people are not playing MST in the main board and you can punish them by setting this card and just negating anything they play. So usually Neklofs only have about 8 slots in their deck for tech cards, so it's really personal preference of which cards you want to play. Personally, I really like MST and Regeki and Dark Hole. So for the extra deck, you want to be playing a Rank 4 Toolbox and Fusions or Synchros for Kaleidoscope Tributes. You want to be playing a level 12, a level 11, a level 10, maybe a level 6 for Brianak, and definitely you want to be playing two Heralds for the Kaleidoscope Unicorn play. Star Eater is a must. Shooting Quasar can be any level 12, and Shooting Star is not that useful, except if you're playing Gungnir. In terms of Rank 4 Toolbox, you need to be playing a Laval Chain, and that's Gusto Emerald. Laval Chain lets, gives you access to the Dijin Lock play, and Emerald gives you access to the Emerald Valk play. Other than that, you can just be playing any Rank 4 Toolbox, so cards like Exiton, Castell, Abyss Dweller, Cowboy, Rhapsody, Diamond Direwolf, Ragna Zero, and Honor Arc are all very good options. So some good cards you want to see in your opening hand include Manju, Senju, Unicor and Kaleidoscope combo, and Brio. These cards are toolboxy cards and will let you continue the circle and, and allow you to create a bigger push and while searching for more cards. Some bad cards that you really don't want to see in your open hand are multiple mirrors, Dijin, cards like Gungnir, Decisive Armor, and Trishla who are just the win conditions, and too many utility cards like MST, Dark Hole, Book of Eclipse, Vanity's Emptiness. These cards you don't want to see in multiples because you won't be able to play the deck at all. So in terms of opening plays, Nekloth is actually a very versatile deck with almost unlimited options, which means going first or second actually matter and depends on the matchup and playstyle preference. Usually it is determined by the Dijin lock and whether you want to set it up or try to push through their board. If you choose to go first, you can either set up the Dijin lock, which is very useful against the Mirror Match, Burning Abyss, Shed All, Heroes. And if you go second, you get an extra combo piece to break their board, which is useful against Satellar, Clifford's, and BA. There is rarely a right answer because, you, as you noticed, I say met some matchups twice, and it generally depends on a lot of factors, and you really have to think about it. As such, uh, there's really no right choice between going first or second, but a lot of Neckloth players prefer to go second because they get more combo pieces. So the first play I'm going to show you is the Dijin Lock. Now, the infamous Dijin Lock uh, forces your opponent to not be able to special summon and creates a Clausalus on the board, which is a very beefy monster. So it's done like so, and it requires a Manju or a Senju and a Unicorn or a Kaleidoscope with a searchable alternative. So first, you summon Manju and Senju and use this effect to add the missing piece. Then you would dump Clausalus to add Kaleidoscope to your hand. You would then play the Kaleidoscope and dumping Herald from your extra deck to summon Unicorn. Herald would activate, adding Cycle. You would then overlay the Manju and the Unicorn for Love All Chain. And then you dump one of its materials, preferably Manju, into the graveyard to add, sorry, to dump uh, Dijin. And then you want to play your Cycle to banish Dijin and special summon Clausolus. So this is a two card play and it creates a Laval chain with a Dijin Clausolus on the board. It also uses a lot of resources. As you notice, you use a third of your ritual spells to make this play and a Manju. 
So another very strong opening play is the Digusto Emerald Drawing play. Now this play is very strong because it lets you thin out your deck, use a mirror in the grave, and draw lots of options. It requires a Manju or Senju, a Unicorn, and a Clasolus, or searchable alternatives. And you need, to, you need to remember that you need to keep three monsters in the grave in order to be able to activate Emerald. So you begin this play by summoning a Manju and adding a Brio. You dump the Brio for Valkyris and you dump Clasolus for Kaleidoscope. Next you play Kaleidoscope, sending Quasar or another level 12 to the grave and summoning both Unicorn and Valkyris. Next, you overlay the Manju and Unicorn for Digusto Emerald. And then you dump the Manju for Emerald, returning Manju, Brio, and Clasolus back to your deck. Now it's really important that you choose to dump the Manju instead of the Unicorn, because when Emerald dies, Unicorn will go to the grave so you can activate the mirrors to continue your combos. And the Unicorn is also protected because it has an XYZ material. It can't be banished yet. Next, you draw for Digestor Emerald, and then you tribute both the Emerald and Valkyrie to draw two more cards. Finally, you want to activate the Mirror in the Grave to banish that and a Unicorn, and then add another Mirror. Now this total play will give you 6 cards, and if you open it with 5 cards, this will be 6 cards. If you open with 6 and you do this play, it will actually be 7, so you want to keep that mirror in the grave until uh, you need the combo piece, or you can activate it if you're going to summon again that turn. When you're going second, you want to make a push, and that really depends on the matchup, back rows, and objective. The most important aspect of the push is to consider what back row they might have and what cards you ideally want to end the board with. Also, what happens after you search the next card to continue the circle of your push. Ideally, you want to use all three mirrors for a push and when you do, you can usually end the game. So in this opening hand, we have Manju, Unicorn, Trishula, Brio, and two utility cards, which in this case is a Book of Eclipse and MST. You can begin this push by playing Manju. You add Kaleidoscope from your deck. You play Kaleido, dumping Herald and summoning Unicorn. Herald continues the cycle and searches Cycle. Brio then searches Shrit. You activate Cycle, dumping Shrit to special summon Brio. Shrit activates and searches Clasolus. You then dump Clasolus to search Mirror, and you will activate your last spell and banish Shrit to summon Trishula. So on your board is 8700 damage, you remove 2 extra deck cards, 1 card from the hand, grave, and field, and it's potentially a minus 4 for, minus four for your opponent. Brio can be summoned, the Brio summon can be replaced with whatever fits the situation like Decisive Armor or Gun Gear. Notice how in this play, it's Shrit, Herald, and Manju being the bridging pieces in the circle, and not Brinac, Clasolus, or Unicorn. Remember what was said earlier, the variations are almost infinite and can change depending on the situation and what's the read. So three cards that are really useful in the tactical play is Gungnir, Decisive Armor, and Valkyris. These three cards will help you in really different situations that will let you win the game just by themselves. So Gungnir and Decisive Armor are really good in low resource or low advantage game states where they can control the board very easily. Decisive Armor lets you banish face down, so including monsters and traps, which means top decks are almost very useless against it. Gungnir also lets you destroy cards on both their turn and your turn, which is very strong tactically when the opponent is just top decking, because you can trade your mirrors in your hand or cards you top deck to remove their back rows or the monsters that they're summoning. Valkyrie is also a very good card when you're under the gin lock or you're trying to stall so that you're drawing for outs, because the ending battle phase effect can really save your life points. You can also keep cycling it by searching it with Brio, searching it with Manju and Senju, 
and adding it back to hand with Unicorn. So a play that I really like is to dump Brio to search a Unicorn and then using the Unicorn to add back Brio so that you can have a material in the graveyard to use your Valkyris in the early game. It's pretty decent in the mirror if your hand is not that great and you open Valkyris because then the Brio is still in your hand so that you can make plays as you draw into cards in the future and you don't leave anything on the board to get trished. So the three ritual spells, Kaleidoscope, Mirror, and Cycle all have three really unique abilities that lets you Ritual Summon without using three resources and only using two. Kaleidoscope is very good in the early game because it lets you dump cards from your extra deck as a tribute for certain Ritual Summons, so leading you to only need a Ritual Monster and Kaleidoscope itself for the summon. Necros Mirror is also really unique because it lets you banish Necros cards from the graveyard as the tribute for the summon. So again, you only need the monster and the spell. And finally, Necros Cycle is like Monster Reborn because it lets you summon monsters from the graveyard while using a tribute in hand or a tribute like Dijin in the graveyard with the ritual spell. So it's potentially a one card ritual summon and most of the time it's a two card ritual summon. So keep in mind that these three ritual spells are all different and Kaleidoscope is good in the early game, Mirror and Cycle are better in the late game. So playing against Necros can actually be very easy. Uh, you just have to keep these four tips in mind. So the tip number one that I have for you is to always use your back row efficiently. Don't use it on Manju, Senju, and the connecting pieces or the searching pieces, but use it on the win conditions like Trishula, Gungnir, and Decisive Armor. These monsters, when they come on the board, will gain a ton of value if they get their abilities off. So you want to remove them with cards like Trap Trick Strapple Nightmare, Fiendish Chain, and Mass Removal like Mirror Force or Torrential. These cards are all really good against them, and if you use them efficiently, the matchup shouldn't be a problem because the Necros player needs to play two cards at least to make one of the summons, and if you use one card, like Trap Trick Strapple Nightmare, you're winning. So tip number two that I have for you is to play Floodgates. Floodgates like Mistake, Vanity's Emptiness, Skill Drain, and Anti-Spell Fragrance, including the new Lose a Turn that is coming out in the next set, are great Floodgates to play against Necroth. These cards will be able to stop their combos and the searches, and stop the push and the cycle from continuing. The third tip is to play around Trishula. If you look at the card, Trishula actually needs to banish one from the field, the graveyard, and the hand in order to banish. So if you empty your hand by setting everything, or leaving nothing on the board, or not having a monster uh, in the graveyard, or any cards in the graveyard, you can play around Trishula and they can't use Trishula, which means they're not getting a lot of value from their summon. So the last tip I have for you is to remember to stop the recurgence. You want to use cards like Mind Crush to pluck cards like Brianak out of their hand so they can't continue with their combos. You also want to use an XYZ called Rhapsody and Berserk, which will banish the mirrors so that they can't recover their mirrors for free from the graveyard. This really stops their combos and makes them a lot harder to use. So some cards you really want to side against them include Mistake, because they don't get to search off Brio, Manju, and Senju, and it stops a lot of their combos. You can also side cards like Imperial Iron Wall and Necro Valley, which prevent them from banishing and recovering with mirrors, which stops Trishula and a lot of their recursions. Cards like Effect Veiler can deal with their monster effects like Trishula or Decisive Armor, which makes their monster summons not very cost efficient. You can also use miniature floodgates like Nichiria Beast and Anti-Spell Fragments. These cards prevent spell cards from being played and the Necros deck is pretty much 20 spell cards. Finally, the traditional big beaters like Kaiku and Thunder King hurt Neckloth a lot. Thunder King prevents them from searching, kind of like Mistake, but it's also a big beater on the, on the board. And Kaiku prevents them from using Valkyris, which means your aggressive plays can go through and you can kill them faster. So two more cards that are really good against Necros is Spell Canceler, which acts as another floodgate kind of like Nature Beast to prevent their spells from being played. And of course, Shared Ride. Shared Ride lets you draw cards every time they search, so it pretty much is like a maxi against Necros. 
and it really stops them from doing too aggressive of a play and it punishes them for searching every turn. That's all for now. If you like this Neckloth in depth profile, please give us a like. If you have any questions or you think I missed something, make sure you comment below and make sure you subscribe. Until next time, make sure to follow to your MST.tv.